And after I start being a spiritist, I start coming to a spirit center, I could actually realize how important it is, according to the spiritism, with the spiritist view, how important those words are, the words we choose every day. And so uh, for the last three months, I've been doing this research. I've been studying a lot. And let, let's see the results of <laughs> this study here. <laughs> So first, I'd like to begin this lecture with the principle of things, as we can see in Genesis. In Genesis, the book that shows how God created all things, created us, created Earth, step by step, it says in this book, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Looking like this, it seems very simple. Let there be light, and the lights are on, and he could actually do all the steps of the creation just like that, just using his words. Why does that happen? If we see uh, in the Spirit's book, the first questions that Kardec asks to the Spirits is, what is God? He doesn't ask who is God, but he asks, what is God? And the Spirits explain to him that God is the supreme intelligence and also the first cause of all things. It's because we learned since we were little and so many different cultures uh, for the last thousands of years, we have the tendency to think about God like that old person uh, with the, a beard, very white beard, because we have this tendency to, pers uh, to personify God in a way that we can understand God. But God is way, way above that. We can't understand all his power, all his intelligence. That's why in the Bible they try to explain to us that the word was created just like that with the words. Because for God, using these words is the same thing as using his thoughts or his actions. At the same time, uh, he thinks, he acts, and very different from us, for example. And this little sentence demonstrate the willpower that God has. Now let's go to the gospel according to John, it's still in the Bible. John, he starts telling the story of Jesus here on earth, not telling uh, when Jesus was born or the first things Jesus did here with the apostles, with the disciples. Instead of that, John starts the gospel with this sentence here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we can see that the same thing that we saw in Genesis. In Genesis, he is explaining the creation. John, he chooses to start telling Jesus' story about telling also about the creation. To understand that, let's see what the word word means its origin. Sometimes we can both have the word or verb. In some translations we can find in the beginning was the verb and the verb was with God and the verb was God. That's why because they came from the same origin from the Greek from this word logos. So logos can also mean word, can mean also verb. Sometimes it can be used as story. So we can have the same word used as story, the word logos. But there was a person who started to use this logos in a different way. It was Heraclitus. He was this Greek philosopher that lived between 535 and 475 before Christ. He started his work even before Socrates and Plato. And he used to say that all entities come to be in accordance with this logo. What was he wanted to, what did he want to tell us when he used these sentences? He was telling us that Logos was like a reason, an account, and also the divine principle. So that time he could say that each and every one of us, we have to, to follow the rules of this divine principle. That's what Spiritism was later on going to say, that we have the divine laws, we have the gods and the natural laws. So. Heraclitus, he used the word logos also to say that it was the divine principle. So here we have, can have a clue that the word can be the divine principle. As we saw before, 
in the beginning with the genesis we are seeing now, and it can be the same thing for us. We're going to see later on how it works. But you can say, okay, but John may have thought in Hebrew, and what does the word mean in Hebrew? If you come to Hebrew, the word comes from davar, and it also means intelligence. So here we can see that it can be also the divine principle, it can be also the intelligence, as we saw that God is the intelligence, the supreme intelligence. So the word can also be associated to intelligence. Now, let's talk about ourselves. The first word that almost everyone says when we are child, when we are starting how to to talk when we are between one, two, three years old, is mother. No matter what language, no matter what culture we are from, everybody says one of the first words is mother. And let's also take a look at the origin of this word. According to the University of Auckland, in New Zealand they had this research from 2012, and they were trying to see what, what word, who were the first people to use this word mother in their daily life. Where did it come from? And they could find that it was originated in this word matter. It's a Proto-Indo-European language. And it's a language that was used here 9,500 years ago. So we can see it didn't change a lot through all this time because we have from the Latin matter that today we can see in Italian, in Spanish, madre, from the Russian mat, Persian madar, Polish matka, and also from the English we have the mother. So this single word, through all these years, it changed very little. And going a little bit back, back not to the cavemen, but almost there, we find this study of the University of Reading in England from 2013. And what did they try to do? They tried to do almost the same thing, but they tried to see how they could follow that language backward and see one, the same, uh, one single language that originated all the languages that we speak, or almost all of them. So they usually, they tracked these words, mother, not, what, to hear, and man. And they could find that it was one ancestor, one single language, who originated the 700 contemporary languages that we have today. So they could see that they, almost, they also said that we could go back in time 15,000 years ago and have a conversation with one of those people who lived there, actually we, because we were there <laughs> in other incarnations. We could talk to ourselves, we could talk to <laughs> ourselves from that time using these words, mother, not, what, to, hear, or man, and there would be a very good chance that they could understand it. We, they could actually talk to us, or at least understand what we wanted to say. Now, still with the word mother, I'd like to bring to us uh, this extract from the book The Magic Staff from Andrew Jackson Davis. Andrew Jackson Davis is the spiritual guide here of Inner Enlightenment. He lived in New York State. Uh, in the 19th century, and he's considered like the John of the Baptism of the spiritualism and the spiritism. This book, The Magic Staff, he is his autobiography. So he's telling all his first memory, all his story when he was a child, when he was young. And this chapter, he's talking about he was three years old, he was playing very near the house he used to live, upstate here in New York, and he suddenly realized that he was alone and he felt lonely, so he says, I scrammed a word, the sound of which I had still then no knowledge of my power to make, mother, mother. It's not the first time he says that word, but it's the first time, he, the, the first uh, memory that he has of telling that word. So he could understand with three-year-olds years old, how important that word was for him. And from the moment that he says that, his mother comes and he starts to sing to him. So he says, my infant mind readily caught the song as my blessed mother sung it. 
and I felt justified in recording the eccentric word as a tribute to the first impression which her spirit made upon the memory of mine. So it's very important here for us to see how he describes that. He used this first impression that her spirit, the spirit of her mother, made upon his memory. And if we take a look, uh, the word mother is very powerful. For example, we have here in the spirit center, we have in other spirit centers, mediumistic meetings. And usually we receive spirits that are very angry. They have so much hatred inside of them, sometimes for years, sometimes for centuries. It's very difficult for the counselors to talk to them because what happens in this uh, mediumistic meeting? Uh, they, we we have received the spirits, the mediums channel these spirits so the counselors can talk to them and try to uh, give them the, 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 the advice, the help that they need, the counseling. So sometimes it's very difficult, they don't want to talk. So one of the tools that we have is to bring the word mother, to, to bring this memory of the mother. Usually when the spirit doesn't want to talk and we ask, don't you have someone you love in your life? Don't you remember your mother when you were young, when you were a child? Imagine your mother hugging you and they are open really to listen to us, to listen to the counselors and actually to receive the treatment that the Spirit Center has to give to them. So this word, mother, it comes with so many power, so many energy and so many feelings and memories that each one of us, we have this within us. Now we're still with Andrew Jackson Davis. This is the book, The Magic Staff. Now I'm going to the chapter 21 in which I go to school. Uh, Andrew Jackson Davis, he first went to school when he was 10 years old. Uh, and he wasn't, uh, he wasn't very easy for him to learn. He started to learn how to read and how to right when he was 10, and he had so many difficulties at school. It was a very difficult process. And then he, he explains, several of the boys call me Gumpy, and a few girls call me Sleepyhead, the former teacher call me Blockhead, and my eldest sister call me Dummy. This epithet tended to increase the characteristics in me which suggested them, and so I grew no wiser or happier among those of my own year or circumstances. Here is what we call today bullying, that the kids go to the school and talk to others, some bad words, and they give some, nickname, some nicknames. And even today, the psychologists, they said that, they proved that this bullying, you, when you call someone those names, you are just reinforcing those characteristics on the kid. And the kid actually is growing up with a very low self-esteem. He won't believe he's capable of doing some things. In this case, he wouldn't believe he was capable of learning. He, and it's not only something that happened with the kid. Any of us, we can do that every day in our lives, no matter if with a kid of ours, a child, or sons, or some friends of ours, sometimes a coworker. We go to a coworker and say, you're not doing that right. You don't know nothing. You don't know how to do. You can do it better. Sometimes the words that we use, instead of uh, trying, to, uh, trying to help the people to overcome that difficulty that the person has, we also has, we have this tendency to worse the situation. And i just tell a very quick story that happened to me when I was 25, 26 years old. I was already a journalist, I was working on TV, on a TV station, but I had this problem with my speech. My voice was very like a voice of a teenager and I was already 26 years old, six foot and four, <laughs> feet and four, so I was a very tall person talking like almost a child. And I needed to do some speech uh, therapy with a speech pathologist. I remember I was there for three, four months, and one day she came to me and she said, yeah, uh, we've been working together for such a long time, three, four months. You're not growing, you're not, I, I don't think it's working. And you know, some people have this gift to, to talk, have this gift to, 
to be a journalist, a TV journalist, maybe you should try to change your career. Why don't you go and be a public relations? Why don't you try some other things? And that was so, so it was just like Andrew Jackson Davis says here. It increased that characteristic that I was not capable. And for a long time, I thought that I was not capable. Even I changed the speed pathologist. I went to a doctor. I, <laughs> I went to the doctor. Actually, I have an organic problem. I need to go uh, to, to have a surgery. But even after the surgery, after going to another speed pathologist, it was very difficult for me because any time someone talked about my voice, I, yeah, all those memories came back and I thought that, that I wasn't capable to be a journalist as I wanted to be and as I am today. So it's very dangerous. We need to be very careful on what words we're going to use when you, we are talking, especially professionally, like a professional like this person when talking to someone. And talking about voice, here we have a uh, very small uh, picture here, uh, how the spoken word is mm, produced. It's basically, we have this air pressure that goes from the lungs to our vocal cords. It vibrates the vocal cords and then it produces the sound. And our articulators, that is our mouth, our lips, our tongue, they produce the sounds that we have to make the letters, to make the words. So it's basically what happens here in the physical world. But what about in the spiritual world? How can we relate? Do we do this relation between the spiritual world and the physical world? Now, according to Emmanuel, Emmanuel is the spirit guide of Chico Xavier, the Brazilian medium. And according to him, in the book Seara dos Mediums, we don't have a translation to English, unfortunately. But according to him, uh, the vocal cord is like a live harp. So he compares that any, each time we move the strings of the harp, it's like we are producing a voice, a melody. It's the same thing that happens here when we are talking and our vocal cords are vibrating. And this harp, it expresses our thought, the thought of our soul. So according to Emmanuel, each time that we talk, each word that we say, it expresses our soul. And according to this expression, according to what we say, the words, they work as a magnet. Let's just pretend, for example, we are here and Thiago and Fred they are playing the violin and the piano. They are playing a classical music and there is someone outside the hall that likes classical music, he's gonna come here and join them to listen to the music. Then they, they try another music, they change to some jazz. Maybe that person doesn't like jazz, he's go away. But there are maybe other two people outside that like jazz, they come here and join us. The same happens when we speak. It's like a magnet. If we uh, we always express our mental shadow or light according to Emmanuel. So depending on what we, say, what we say, we are expressing this shadow. What does he mean with this shadow? He says that we, uh, because Emmanuel says that we are all mediums of the word. That means every time we speak, we are not alone. We are attracting many spirits. Maybe good spirits, maybe bad spirits. So these spirits are our mental shadow or our mental light. According to the words that we use, we can attract good spirits or bad spirits. And our speech, they, are, they show the moral group we belong to. So according to the language, according to the speech that we have, is the moral group that we belong to. But here I just wanted to, to say that this language, this speech, I'm not talking about vocabulary because we know that each person has a different upbringing depending on where we were raised. If we has a formal education or not, we may have a different kind of vocabulary of kind of language that we use. But here I'm talking about the moral language. If we are using good words, words that can 
help people, help ourselves of if, if we are using a bad language. Some language there are going to be very hard, hurtful to, to, to the people. And the same things happen here in the book Workers of the Life Eternal. It's the book by the Spirit André Luiz, channeled by Chico Xavier. Uh, this chapter is talking about the sanctuary of blessing. This is a place in the spiritual realm where the spirits go to prepare themselves to come here to some missions on earth. So they go there to spend some days, to spend some weeks preparing to come here on earth. Because let's imagine we are here and we want to go deep in the sea. We're going to dive. We need to prepare ourselves. You need to use the special clothes. You need to use some mass, some oxygen. The same happens when the spirits are in the spirit realm. They need to come here. They are in the more elevated uh, zone. They want to come here on Earth. It's difficult for them. No, they need to be prepared to do that. And the Cornelius, who is the instructor, he is explained to Andrea Luis how they should prepare themselves. And he says, we must choose and order our words carefully so as to create an environment that is favorable to, for the service intended. What is said creates the environment and has a defining role in the success or failure of a mission. So one of the most important things that Cornelius says to Andrea Luis is that they need to be careful with the words that they use. If they are going to be there to prepare themselves, they need to pay attention to the words they are using. Because according to him, the word, the divine power, can act as co-workers in our actions. So we can see that he used the word as a divine power, the same thing that we saw in the beginning, just in the Genesis and in the Gospel. So he says that the word is the divine power and can act as a co-workers in our actions. How does it work? Now he's telling about us here, incarnate spirits on earth. He gives uh, to Andrea Luis a number. He says that in half of the elevated institutions here on earth, oh, I mean, in all the institutions here on earth, half of the time, we don't use the words as you were supposed to use. Sometimes half the times you use bad words, you gossip, we criticize people. And he said that it happens because we, humans, beings here incarnate, our words create living images that develop in the mental soil onto which they cast, thereby producing good or bad consequences according to their origin. He says that we don't have this idea that it happens. If we had, if you knew, we wouldn't use the speech as we are used to. So the words create living image. And it's like I brought here the theory of communication that we have the, simple, uh, the simplest one that we have. It happens like this one. We have these three parts, the codifying, send a message and decodify. So if I think about a tree, I have this image in my head, the tree. So I codify this to the word tree. I send these messages, this message, and the person who listens will decodify. We'll take this word, we'll transform again in an image. The same happens in this spirit word, in the visible word. Every time we say how many words we say, according to some studies, each person says between 15,000 and 30,000 words a day. So imagine how many living images we are creating every day. And they also have this vibration meter there at the sanctuary of the blessing. It's a, an instrument that indicates the nature of the words that are being used. So they can realize they can see if they are creating a good environment or not. It would be so good if we could have one of those here each time that we use. And the word's not that good. It's going to sound an alarm, do anything like that. We should have one here, right here in the Spirit Center, especially before and after the meetings, when you have this tendency, all of us have this tendency to change the conversations, to change. Uh, what we're talking about, and sometimes we are here in the house of assistance, sometimes this can really change the vibration of the environment.
now Joana de Angeles, who is the spirit guide of the Brazilian media and uh, speaker Divaldo Pereira Franco. She sent this message to Divaldo Franco in Santa Monica, here in the United States, California, in 1988. She's telling about the word, about speech and the language. And she says that the word is the mission of thought, as we saw with the, uh, Andrea Luis and Emmanuel. She says also it's a vehicle with a high vibrational load. This, uh, I could just reinforce that each word we use has this high vibrational load. So sometimes even when we think a message is good, if we use one word that's not that good, it can change completely the message. For example, this week I received uh, a comic strip from a friend of mine. She knows that I love the Snoopy, the Peanuts cartoon. So she sent me a comic strip. It was like Snoopy and Lucy, that uh, black hair girl. She, Snoopy was skating around one side to the other. And she says, I can't believe you can be that happy, the other one. I can't believe you can't be that happy. Nobody can be that happy. And then Snoopy thinks, maybe she's right and can't be that happy. And then the last one, it was, of course, it wasn't the original. Someone changed that because it was Snoopy using a very bad language. Just to say, yeah, I don't care what people think about. I can't be that happy. But the word that you use that I'm not going <laughs> to say here, <laughs> It, it, for me, for my opinion, it just broke the whole message because it could be a very good message of you don't have to pay attention to what the other says. If they say you are not happy, but you are happy, you are feeling happy, you can be happy no matter what the other's opinion. But for me, from the moment that the person who changed that, uh, that, that, that dialogue and put that bad language, that bad, very bad word there, from it broke the whole message. And because it brought to me all that vibration, all, all that lower vibration, I could feel that because it, it's not, it was not supposed to be there. And Joana de Angelis always says that <clears throat> its proper use makes it a powerful instrument. And when loaded with sincerity and faith, the word acts as a vibratory wave that stifles the negative forces that involve the person. So it's very powerful for us to think about that. We use, can use our words, each word we say is like a wave of vibrations that we are sending. There is a study of this Dr. Masuro Enura, I think his name. Let me just check, I have it here. Masaru Emoto. Masaru Emoto, thank you. Uh, he studied from 1994 to 2008. He studied some waters, the crystallized waters. His idea was to see in a microscope what was the shape of the crystals of water. So he first he took some waters from rivers, lakes, uh, purified water, and look at, at it. And then in the second phase, he tried. Why, uh, why don't I take the water and send some messages to the water to see if it changes anything? So he was sending some good messages, some prayers, some music, good music. And then he sent to some other waters bad messages for hatred, jealousy. And then he looked at the microscope and compared. And it was a huge difference. The, words, the, the water that received the good message it was very beautiful crystals, very different uh, shapes. The waters that received the very bad messages, it was very deformed. It was totally another thing. We wouldn't say they were water, that we looking at the water, we think they are the same one. But if we do this kind of research, he proved that it wasn't the same because of the vibrations that we send, the vibrations that we send to the water it changed the, completely the, the water. Imagine the vibrations that we send and we receive every day one from each other. Now let's go to this book, Jesus in the Home, by uh, Chico Xavier. Uh, it's, uh, this book uh, 
Jesus, this book tells the story uh, that Jesus used to gather in Simon Peter's house to tell to the disciples some stories, some lessons, but it was very simple stories, but with so many layers of teachings and of knowledge. One of these stories is in the chapter 39, The Power of Darkness. Jesus is saying that some spirits of evil wanted to hurt a valuable servant. There was a person who was very devoted to God, was a very valuable servant, was doing a good work here on earth, and for that reason, the spirits of evil wanted to hurt him, wanted to uh, put this person down so he w wouldn't do that good work he was going to do. They had many ideas. For example, one spirit said, why don't we go and take all his money? And the other, ah, if we take all his money, he will work harder. He will think it's a, a trial of God, from God. So he would thank God for having this trial in his life and he work harder. Everything is going to be fine. The other said, why don't we kill? Why don't you do something with his family? And they said, but he's going to be alone. He's going to devote, be more devoted to God. He will spend all his time praying to God. So what was the idea that actually worked? One of the spirits said, go and tell this man that he amounts to zero in creation. And it worked. The spirits went there. Here we are talking about like obsessions because the spirits go there and give these ideas to, to, to this man. And some weeks later, the man was very depressed. He stopped doing all the good work he was doing. So you can imagine, they tried so many things. The thing that worked was just sending this message to, to the man. So it can work to any of us. That's why John Ajangeli said that we need to be we need to take care, be worried about this word that we use because we can change, we can be protected by having uh, a good work and by receiving good words. And here in the book Living Spring, it was the lesson that Valeria uh, read to us in the beginning of the, the lecture, before the lecture, the words of eternal life. They say that words surround you in every phase of the struggle and in every aspect of the way. So we have the words surrounding us, no matter if we are happy, if we are sad, in any situation that we are, we have the words from the incarnate and from the discarnate spirits. So we are never alone. If we think we are alone, we are not. We, have, we always have so many friends around us. Can be good friends, can be not that good friends. <laughs> And he says that friendly words brought to you by your devoted brothers and sisters encouraging and consoling you. Here, uh, I'd like to make a comparison of these friendly words, how powerful they are, and how we can see those words as charity, for example. Many times you think that charity is just going and do some kind of work, giving money, make some soup for the homeless or anything like that. But sometimes we can do charity with our speech. Here we have twice a month the visit to the nursing home and we go there, today Kleber was there, and we go there and we talk to our friends for about between one hour and a half, two hours, and that's what they want, that's what they need. They need to have someone to talk to them, to listen to their stories, no matter if it's the same story every week, <laughs> where we go, depending on, on the memory of the person. And they also need to receive that kind words that we have to, to, to bring to them. It's so easy, and it, we can do that anytime with everyone around us. Sometimes a friend who is going in a depression, he's very depressed, the only thing that he needs is to receive a phone call and talk some minutes so he can receive that love and, and all that kindness from us. So we can actually, you need to actually start seeing these words as charity. So it's so easy to go in the street, say hello, good morning to someone. It can really change the day of 
each and every one of us. And also here in the Leaf Spring, they say that nonetheless, in the many spoken or silent verbal expressions, amidst which your mind develops, you will find the words of eternal life. What is the words of eternal life? Yes, we saw it's Jesus. Here we go back again to the beginning when we saw the gospel according to John. John said that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And John continues and said, says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the word that became flesh is Jesus. Jesus is the one who brought the word of God, the thoughts, and not the knowledge that God have, has to us here on earth. He is the highest elevator spirit that was, has ever been here. He is the he is the, 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 uh, the word, the governor. the governor, yes. Thank you, uh, I was missing that word. <laughs> he is the governor of the planet Earth. So when he came here, he came to bring the words of God. I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. And here we have this beautiful house because he also said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So we can build our house in the rock. We can build our foundation on the rock. How? Using Jesus' word, Jesus' knowledge, and all the lessons that he brought to us. Emmanuel also says that, the, that Jesus' word were so powerful that the disciples and all those people, because Jesus used to speak to many, many thousands of people for hours. And according to Emmanuel, it was so powerful. The, his words were so powerful that people there could actually watch the stories like a movie. They could see what Jesus was t uh, telling them in front of them like if it, were, if it was a movie. And also, Jesus says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Going to the Genesis by Allan Kardec, Allan Kardec says that Jesus' word will be true for all time. And since Jesus' mission was to bring God's thought to humankind, only his pure doctrine can be the expression of that thought. That's why heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away, because the words of Jesus, the words he brought to us are the truth. That's why we can always believe, can always count on those words and those lessons. We can take any of uh, the parables that Jesus uh, used to say that we have uh, in the Bible. If we read the, the parables, each time you read, we are going to find another knowledge, another thing that we didn't see before because we have so many different layers of knowledge and of teachings there. Each time you read, we can find a new one. Now, here uh, in the book Happy Life by the spirit Joanna de Angelis, she's, here she like summarize this lecture because I'm gonna read uh, each part separately. She says, a kind word generates stimuli and values that turn into precious results. Words have lifted up civilization just as they have driven multitudes to war and destruction. Here we have many examples of, uh, of dictators, of kings, of presidents, so many different people that use, have, have been used and still use their word to the good or to the bad. We have some, I, I won't, say the names because I don't want to, <laughs> to, to break the harmony, but we have some people that w w came here with such a powerful speech, but instead of using the, uh, those, that speech to, to lift up uh, the, 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 pers the, the people and to do something good for humankind, they use those speech to gather so many soldiers to go to the wards, to the wars, or something like that. But on the other hand, we have 
too many examples of people who use and still uses those speech actually to do something good to all of us. So use words to rescue, encouraging those who have fallen to get back up, those who are asleep to awaken, those in error to correct themselves, and the aggressive to calm down. Here we have, like I just said, we can use this word to help others, like a charity, but we know that helping, helping others, we actually help ourselves. From the moment that we raise our hands to our brothers or, or sister, we are also receiving help. From the moment, if we think about the words as a magnet, if we are sending this love and all this kindness through our speech, we are also receiving all that love and the kindness back, not only from that person, but from so many that we can't see, so many spirits around them, they are, are there looking for them, helping them every day. And Joana de Angelis also says, speak with elevation and kindness, make yourself a faithful microphone in the service of goodness. That's why I have the picture of a microphone. We can imagine each and every one of us like a microphone sending peace, goodness, harmony, love, and joy to many, many people. And not only speaking, because today we also have the Facebook, we have so many social media, and each thing that we write, how many people can read that? We have no idea how many people we reach with a single message that we post on Facebook, for example. And it was like an elder sent me uh, some uh, picture this week. It was saying that we cannot, uh, once we say a word, we cannot erase it. We, if it's something not good, we can ask for forgiveness, but we can erase. That's why we need to be very caref careful because, especially on the internet, once we write anything, we cannot go back. And how many people can read before we even notice that? But on the opposite, how many people can read the good messages that we can send to them every day? And now just to end, as I told you that I love Snoopy, here we have Charlie Brown saying, sometimes I lie awake at night and I ask, is life a multiple choice test or is it a true or false test? Then a voice comes to me out of the dark and says, we hate to tell you this, but life is a thousand word essay. <laughs> so let's do like Charlie Brown for me. This is like his spirit guide telling this <laughs> message to him. Let's pretend we have these thousand words in our life to write. So if I had only 1,000 words, I would, would write each one of them very carefully. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.